Buongiorno a tutti. Eccoci qua. Just a brief greeting, un piccolo saluto in italiano e poi passiamo immediatamente all'inglese, ma io sono Paola Antonelli, questa è Alice Rostorn e siamo molto molto fieri di essere qui con voi al salone. Now I'm going to switch to English because I see that there's a lot an international audience. So we're super happy and also the people online. Um, I'm Paola Antonelli, Alice Rostorn next to me. We're super happy and super proud to be in Milano once again. The Satellite is back together with the Salone, because it's not the Salone and then the Satellite, it's the Satellite and then the Salone. We're back here and we are guests of Milan, but also especially of Marva Griffin, the founder of the Salone Satellite. And today we're here to present a, a work of love, a work of love and of passion uh, that Alice and I did together that is called Design Emergency. It is a research platform and a book, and Alice will tell you more about it. Thank you, Paula, and thank you all of you for coming and to everyone online for uh, logging on. Now, Design Emergency, as Paula says, is a labor of love for both of us, and it began at the start of the pandemic when Paula and I, as friends did at the time, were Zooming to catch up with one another. And one of the things we were um, really focused on was how design was emerging as a rare good luck story during um, the pandemic. Because at a time when people knew so little about COVID-19 and the threat that we were facing, designers immediately responded generously, courageously, and ingeniously by producing solutions. These were picked up by the general media, so Paola and I felt that this really could be a game changer for design, where if people understood the constructive and meaningful impact it was having at a time of critical global emergency, they would look at design very differently and understand its value as a social, political and ecological tool to tackle other major crises. So we began Design Emergency as an Instagram platform initially to interview the people who we felt were the global design leaders of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but then we broadened it out to the global design leaders of the future. Mm -hmm. So, Paola. And you know, the way we chose the designers is kind of natural. So we were both looking at what was happening in the world and we have, as Alice explained, this passion to try and explain to people, to as many people as possible, how important and multifaceted design is. Um, Alice was already working. She has a wonderful Instagram feed that I'm sure you already know pretty well. And she had started a really full-fledged research. We're having a little bit of problems with the clicker. So so um, I don't know if any technician can come and help us and make it work. That would be great because we have some great slides for you. So they'll come up very quickly. But uh, it was really quite amazing to see how much was happening all over the world. So we started out with Michael Murphy, who is a great architect that is also, maybe we can say, uh, is it working? Uh, not yet, but they're fixing it. Oh, because otherwise you can maybe change the slides yourselves. So, oh. Uh, I'm gonna say, we're gonna say next, which is a little, can you try again? Can you try again, Alice? Mm. No. Nope, no. So maybe you can change them yourself. But so we, we were looking at what was going on in the world. Alice was already studying this amazing research. And the first person that we interviewed, uh, who is also the person that we interviewed two weeks ago to celebrate the launch of the book, is Michael Murphy. Here we go. It's working, it seems. Um, so you see it's uh, an investigation into design's response to COVID-19 was the initial subtitle, and then it evolved. So Michael Murphy was the first, an architect specialized in health systems, but then came very naturally, for instance, Alyssa Eckert, who together with Dan Higgins designed the branding of the coronavirus, the mean landmine, the mean deep water mine that we all have come to know as the image of COVID. And naturally, we progressed to talk to designers, both professional designers and accidental designers, because we even had Professor Marco Ranieri from the Polyclinic in Bologna, who designed a way to split the ventilator and uh, allow for more people to be saved in conditions of emergency. So it was kind of natural to look around, at least natural for us, because we have learned to detect great design wherever we can find it. And 
bring together these great examples and offer them to the world so that the world could understand the power of design. Okay, so as the clicker isn't working, could you um, advance to the next slide and then to the one Wonderful. after that? This is, these are the projects that Paula's just been discussing, the grid for our COVID-19 interviews. And on to the next slide, please. Excellent. So after eight weeks of focusing on the design response to COVID-19, um, so that took us into early summer 2020, we moved on to what is the full focus of design emergency and the specific focus of the, the book, investigating design's role in radically redesigning and reconstructing our lives to build a better future. If you look back at historic emergencies from the great plagues to world wars, they have almost always catalyzed significant change across society and across our ecologies. And we we were absolutely convinced that COVID-19 could be a game changer in the same way. So we felt that our role and responsibility as design champions was to show examples of global design leaders um, who were already experimenting with practical solutions to the profound complex and intersectional problems that people faced all over the world. And we felt that by giving practical examples um, of the work they were doing, it would really convince people of design's power to help us build a better future and give us hope and optimism at what was still a very confused, chaotic, and of course tragic and terrible for many people time. So we compiled a list of the major issues that we faced, the climate emergency, obviously the refugee crisis, the housing crisis and homelessness, growing inequality, the rise of intolerance and bigotry. Um, we looked at abuses of technology and growing technophobia. Um, and we also looked at the, the opportunities that design was creating, the availability of open source intelligence and other new design tools that were enabling really ingenious designers to experiment in many different ways. And we then identified the designers who we felt were absolutely at the forefront of developments in all those spheres and approached them and tried to persuade them to be interviewed by us on design emergency. And luckily for us, almost all of them said yes. So next slide, please. You can see the variety of design that we had. You know, today we're going to talk to you about only six of the designers, but it really ranged very wide. Some people are very well known to you, like Forma Fantasma, of course. Who doesn't in this kind of arena know about Forma Fantasma? Some might be known to you, like Xu Tian Tian. But then we also had designers like Hilary Cotton, who are more specialized in a form of design that might not well be well known to all, but should be well known. So it was a great opportunity really to show as much as possible of the, um, of the atmosphere and of the landscape of design. We also had once a week uh, some interventions about some pick of the week, so some ideas and things that we had learned about that were connected to the theme of design emergency. And when other emergencies happened in the world, for instance, the blast in Beirut, or the fires in California, or the Black Lives Matter uh, crisis, we would also call upon some experts to discuss this particular matter and to actually let people know more about not only the emergency at particular at hand, but also how the design respon response was evolving. So if I could have the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about our first example. So we were saying, Alice said, we were choosing people that responded to some of the emergencies in, in really uh, creative and innovative way. And one of them was Neri Oxman. Neri Oxman is an architect that is based in the United States. She used to work at MIT and be a professor there. Now she has opened her own company called Material Ecology. And her attitude towards design has always been that of trying to bring together organic design, so an attention to nature, computation, she also is a scientist in computational design, and also natural elements like actual natural entities like here you can see silkworms and bring them together. Neri has always felt that 
computation, so the advancements that have been brought today by digital technology could be a way for us to reach the holy grail as designers, which is to try and not only imitate the forms of nature, but actually behave the way nature behaves, because nature does it better. It creates better, it uses better, and it also dies and destroys better. And that's what so much of Neri's work is. It's the attempt to build new processes and new materials that really behave like nature, that have life cycles, that in the end go back to nature. What you're looking at here is one of her silk pavilions. By using computation and studying how silkworms behave, she, together with her great team uh, that's uh, uh, at, uh, at MIT first and now in her company, have found a way to harness the natural work and the natural life cycle of silkworms so that together humans and silkworms can build new structures that in the end could help us also build new buildings. Or I shouldn't say build, but rather grow new buildings. Now I'm going to give the word to Alice for her next example. Next slide, please. Thank you, Paula. Now, we tried to make um, all the interviews we did, all the research we did for Design Emergency as diverse and as eclectic and as inclusive as possible. So this was obviously in terms of gender, heritage, geography, discipline, but also the scale of the projects and the type of design practice that they embodied. And this is one of my favorite examples of a truly epic design endeavor. And it may seem at first like an unorthodox um, use of design, but if you think of it in terms of the strategic application of design, it makes perfect sense. And this is part of what's called the Great Green Wall of Africa. Now, this is a colossal project which is intended to tackle one of the most serious ecological problems of our time, and that is the drought that has destroyed vast swathes of the southern edge of the Sahara Desert. So this is the lower edge of the Sahel region, which stretches for 5,000 miles or 8,000 kilometers from one African coast to another, Senegal in the west coast to Djibouti on the east coast. And this project is um, very typical, I think, of the very complex intersectional projects that design is going to be embracing increasingly in future. And it's very long term. This is not a quick fix solution. The southern edge of the Sahel is one of the driest, hottest and poorest regions of the world. It's absolutely on the precipice of the climate emergency. And in 2007, over a dozen African countries came together under the aegis of the African Union to develop the Great Green Wall as a strategic way of reinvigorating that landscape. Because what began as an ecological problem, drought, then caused other environmental problems, desertification, deforestation, and soil erosion, but then caused profound socioeconomic challenges, famine, poverty, war, conflict, supply problems, mass migration from the area, with all of these problems compounding the others. So it began as a, a land restoration project, which 21 countries in the region are now part of. And the challenge for all of them is to restore their degraded land across this area to make it fertile farmland again. So this is an area that's in Senegal and part of Niger. And um, Senegal has been very much at the forefront of developments with a very successful tree planting program. Niger and Burkina Faso have tended to focus on reinventing traditional agricultural practices to speed up the restoration of their land that way. But of course, there have been colossal problems because this is such a fragile and vulnerable part of the world. So Ethiopia, for example, was one of the countries making the greatest progress until civil war erupted two years ago, and its progress has ossified ever since. But at the beginning of last year, a consortium led by the French government and the World Bank agreed to donate 14.5 billion US dollars to the Great Green Wall and subsequently raised another 5 billion. And this money gives the Great Green Wall, which is currently 20% complete, a fighting chance of achieving its objective of full completion by 2030 with the creation of 10 million new green jobs. So an extraordinarily complex and problematic, but hugely inspiring example of design on an epic scale. Next slide, please. 
Federica Fragapane is our next example for today. She might be a well-known entity or person to some of you. She is based in Turin, not in Milan, but she has been working a lot with Corriere della Sera, especially La Lettura. She represents a beautiful and important new branch of design, which is the visualization of data and of information. Just to give a brief introduction on this topic, on this discipline, which is so central to our life today, the more computational advances have been presented to us, the more we've been able to churn out data that are sometimes so massive and so numerous that we need tools to navigate them. And visualization is one of the most powerful ones. Figures and uh, letters and uh, different bullet points can come and go, but instead images stay forever imprinted in our brain. And not only, therefore, is visualization design a way to explain, but it's also a way to make people remember some truths that would otherwise remain obfuscated. What you're looking at here is one particular visualization Fed that Federica did with that. She works a lot with foundation and not-for-profits. So this is a visualization that she did to highlight the deaths in Brazil of activists that were killed by unknown entities because they were fighting to save the Amazon. So even in this case, it's a scandal. It's an outrage that so many innocent people are killed because they try to save what is the patrimony of the planet, but without a visualization design, designer that paints their deaths in this, with this kind of red flames or red petals, this kind of tragic flowers that remain memorized and imprinted forever in our minds, we would perhaps forget. The way we found out about Federica is because she had worked with the Sergo Foundation in London and Washington DC to create a new index of vulnerability for COVID-19. A vulnerability index identifies different cities or different regions in the world that might be more vulnerable to a pandemic because of different, um, different kind of data points from uh, the uh, presence of local health systems to the, uh, the level of, uh, of like, uh, background, social background of the people that work and live in that particular area. And there was an official one, but Sorgo Foundation found new ways to make it even clearer and closer. And so Federica visualized that index. But also, you might be happy to know that Federica was then called by Marva to do the official pink map of the Salone uh, and the Salone Satellite. So she's also maybe in your hands and in your bags. And Federica will also speak in Milan tomorrow at the IKEA Center in case you are around. Um, she will talk with Emilia Terragni, who's the editor of our book. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, one question that a lot of young designers ask is whether they will be able to use their work as designers to address their social, political, and ecological um, causes, favorite causes, and still make a living. And this was an issue that we needed to address directly in Design Emergency. And an excellent example of a designer who has navigated this brilliantly is Ilsa Crawford, the London-based interior and product designer who runs the multidisciplinary consultancy Studio Ilsa. Now in many respects Studio Ilsa is a conventional commercial design consultancy except for the fact that it's a remarkably successful one. It works on major projects for multinational clients like IKEA, Carl Hansen and Herman Miller but always imbues them with the humanistic and ecological values that are absolutely at the core of all of Ilsa's work because she sees design in all its many manifestations including interior and product design, her specialisms as a tool to improve our well-being individually and collectively and to nurture our ecology. She never compromises these principles, but she proves that they can be of great commercial value to her clients. She also takes on uh, work for non-profit groups, so this beautiful eating space is Refertorio Felix in East London, and it was a very shabby old church hall that Ilsa and her team 
been converted into this beautiful, vibrant community kitchen, which is so successful that the charity that runs it is now funded almost exclusively from the rental it gets by hiring out this gorgeous hall for people's parties, dances, fundraisers, and so on after hours. Um, another project they did for a nonprofit was the Anna Freud Center, which deals um, with mental health issues for children also in London. So Ilsa threw out a very eclectic career as the founding editor of Elle Decoration UK uh, for 20 years as a very influential teacher at Design Academy Eindhoven and through her own practice at Studio Ilsa has always practiced what she preaches proving that good design can be good for business in a very old cliche. The next slide please. There are other disciplines that have been established for centuries, like the kind of design that Ilse uh, Crawford practices, but that also can have new twists. Architecture. Forever, architecture has been connected to buildings, often monuments. It's been a preval prevalently, predominantly male profession, and it's been usually about imposing or giving people what they thought they wanted. Well, Xu Tian Tian, uh, an architect, female architect based in Beijing with her company DNA Architecture, is turning this on its head. Her way of practicing architecture always involves working with the community, finding out what people not only need but also want and hopefully even working with them to create spaces that are communal and that are also available to many different functions and possibilities. Uh, Tian Tian has worked predominantly in the Songyang Valley, which is south of Shanghai, a mountainous uh, region that is made of more than 400 small villages. And each village is, of course, a community, and each village has some specialty, some tradition that is particularly proud of, that the village is proud of. One village is specialized in the production of tofu, another in the production of brown sugar, one village has a very, uh, very vivacious and prolific theater company. And in this particular case, you know, this is so exemplary of the kind of work that Tian Tian does. They created a theater just by bending existing bamboo trees into a canopy that would create a space. This particular theater was put together in three days and it has become the central heart of this village. What, uh, what Tian Tian does with the community she calls architectural acupuncture. It's about finding the minimal, simplest architectural intervention to activate and give dignity and meaning to a whole village. There are tofu factories like that, brown sugar factories that in different regions and moments of the year become social spaces and it's a way to architecture that is inspiring the younger generation worldwide. Next slide please. Um, it's also wonderful to see uh, work like Tian Tian's that really sort of refutes the stereotypes of contemporary China and Absolutely. contemporary Chinese architecture. And I think people were very moved to, to discover that when you interviewed her. And on to another extraordinary designer and another favorite of Marva's, um, who is also combating stereotypes and stigmatization. And this is the brilliant book. Brooklyn-based illustrator Mohammed Fayyad. He was born in nearby Queens um, to a Muslim Indian family and has devoted um, their working life to documenting the lives of their chosen community of trans and queer people of color. Um, so you can see on the left of the screen one of the, the party posters for Papi Juice, which is an art collective of which Mohammed is creative director, and on the right of the screen, part of Mohammed's activist work. And of course, activist design has always been one of the richest and most provocative and most powerful areas of design practice. And Mohammed has interpreted this historical role of design in a very contemporary way through their work for activist groups like Brooklyn Liberation, um, the New York Anti-Violence Project. So this was a project done during the pandemic um, for Brooklyn Liberation Action for Black Trans Lives. And if you look at the faces in the, um, the posters, you see how visually luscious and seductive Mohammed's work always is. I mean, I discovered it on Instagram and I was just immediately drawn to it 
in a completely superficial aesthetic way, but then I realized how powerful and how subtle the political message is. Because these are communities of people who are so often treated in a cliche-ridden and stereotypical way and sort of lumped together in an amorphous mass. Muhammad always focuses on the subtleties, the nuances, the eccentricities, the wit, the joy, the extremities, the fragilities, um, always with lovely little twists like the burger and the cool drink showing it's a puppy juice barbecue on a very hot and sunny day. So um, a wonderful addition to design emergency of a designer who's doing so much to really raise awareness of individual emergencies and to change public and political opinion about them. So next slide, please. As I was mentioning to you before, we really wanted to be able to talk about emergencies that were coming up even after the first phase of the COVID-19 emergency ebbed. And there's one every day. I mean, right now we're living in the middle of a war here in Europe while there are wars elsewhere in the world that are being also waged. And many emergencies are overlapping one over the other. We believe that all these emergencies are connected and we want to be able to really tackle them as they uh, arrive. So we've been talking about um, emergencies like Black Lives Matter, about the Beirut blast, and we want to continue to tackle them. And of course, there's a complexity to life in the world, and there's a complexity to the, to the geopolitical dynamics that happen that requires expertise. So as Alice mentioned at the beginning, this is a research platform. It's not a closed project, and we like to call in experts whenever we don't know enough about the particular subject at hand. And you know, that's also what designers do. Designers know very well what they don't know, and that's what they are able to do. They call in the people that they need in order to bring a project to fruition. And we hope that we will always have access to the experts that we need in order to discuss all different matters. Next slide, please. So the next slide illustrates our beautiful design emergency book, which was um, launched just a couple of weeks ago um, and we're very proud of. And as soon as we launched Design Emergency, I mean, it remains an Instagram platform predominantly and obviously was launched exclusively on Instagram, which proved to be a very flexible medium um, that enabled us to reach a, a broad audience. Um, people started asking whether we were going to do a book very early on in the project, but we decided that we were only going to do a book if we really believed it would add an extra element, it would complement our existing work online. Um, and as Design Emergency developed, and at the beginning, as Paula said, it was very spontaneous, very organic, it was a sort of fun um, emergency project during a pandemic between friends. We had interviewed so many incredible people who'd been so generous with their time, their energy, their ideas, and amassed so much research and information and had a phenomenal response to us, to it, which touched and moved us profoundly. And we came to understand that if we did find a way of using our content and creating new content for a book, it would really add to the project. It would take it to a much wider audience than Instagram could. And it would also, um, because we were writing introductory essays to contextualize all the um, individual projects in Design Emergency, we felt that we could present um, the information in a much broader, more rounded way. So it would really help people to interpret the work of the individual designers differently. And also by sourcing that work all together, it would be a very rich and very different experience for them. So um, we updated and expanded 25 of the interviews we'd conducted in the book, divided it into four sections, technology, society, communication, and ecology. And as I said, began it with the contextual essays. Um, and we were very lucky that we had a dry run because in the first summer of Design Emergency, which amazingly is now over two years old, it's like having a sort of super energetic toddler to look after, um, Wallpaper Magazine approached us. They have a guest editor every year for their October issue. They wanted to do something special during the pandemic 
So they invited Paola and I to guest edit the issue as Design Emergency. So that was kind of a dry run for the book. It focused on the COVID interviews, um, whereas the book focuses very much on building a better future and the long-term challenges for dis design. But again, the response was so fantastic that we realized that we really could do a book that we could be very proud of and that would add something extra to the project. And we very much hope that if you'll read it, you will agree. Next slide, please. Name your emergency. There's always one. You know, even this satellite is about an emergency, maybe a soft one, a slow emergency. There are fast ones, there are really urgent ones, and there are some that are ongoing. Yesterday, we judged the Satellite Awards, and it was about design for our future selves, and it was about the elders, about, it was about recycling and trying to avoid filling landfills before, beyond capacity. So there are emergencies, big and small. We will keep going because there will always be a design emergency, and we will we'll keep going because design is becoming more and more central to the way we face our future. Design is about making revolutions into life. Design is about helping people deal with change and design is, ba it is about helping people also make change happen when it is necessary. So we really do believe that as designers, we have a central role in the future and we're so happy to see so many of you, young and less young, really work at it from the best of your abilities and presenting new ideas. So there will always be a design emergency and Alice and I are hoping to continue this project in all these different means and all these different aspects so long as we will have passion in our hearts and belief in design. So we thank you very much, and we especially thank Marva. Marva, would you mind coming and, uh, and greet your public? Because we began, we began without you because of the uh, live connection, but you are so central to all this. And also, there will be some Q&A right now, so we can take some questions from the audience. What, do you have gifts for us? No way. Oh. Oh, Aww, what are those? <laughs> Come, Marva. We also want the international public to see you. This is a pensiero di sustainability. Oh, wow. That's for Paola. Oh, my God. Oh, Marva, thank you. Oh, my God. No. Why don't wow. you sit? Why don't you sit here? No? Okay. You will stand there? Well, I don't know. I don't know if we want you to stand. What but should I say? Thank you. I, I am so happy and, uh, what should I say, proud to have these two gurus. Ah, look at this. They brought, you, they brought okay. you a chair so design you can sit down too. Design ladies here at Salone Satellite. It's really a, a really important, important event and I'm very, very, very happy. So, Paola. Mm -hmm that Italians must be proud of this lady <laughs> going around the world Yay. for design. <laughs> and Alice, number one lady in design that I met years ago when she was the first director of the Design Museum in London. So I'm very, very, very happy to have them here. So, so if, we have if, if you have questions, questions yeah. for them, they're well, they very happy to answer you, okay? Don't be shy. Because otherwise, if you come after the talk with questions, we're not going to answer them. Either you, you ask now or never. Actually, while you're thinking of questions, it might be um, there, is, there is one question ah, there. Perfect. Yeah, Fire there is right. one question there. Is there a roving mic? No. Okay, the lady over there. Thank you. Hi, Paola. Uh, where could, can we get the, the book in Italy? Oh, thank you. Where I can we get the book? That's a really good question. Where can <laughs> we get the book? Yeah, for those of you who are here, the Satellite, yeah. we couldn't bring the book right here because yeah. of legal issues, I but see. there's a Feltrinelli bookstore here ah. at the Salone, so okay. you can buy it there. Pavilion and some people 15. are... Pavilion 15. And then, and then where you the, shine. <laughs> where the important uh, show of Salone del Mobile is 
placed. It's the, the installation designed by nature by architect Mario Cucinella. And next to it, there is the um, space of Feltrinelli where you can get the book. Okay? Thank you. I saw. Pavilion 15. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah? Chiara, Chiara. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, greetings from Spain. Um, you talk about the design as, as a form to change the world. And sometimes to change big things, you have to be against the establishment and the governments and, and everything. So uh, do you think the design, designing is an act of, an, a revolutionary act? Sorry, could you say the final bit again? Do we think design is... A revolutionary act. Uh, it absolutely can be, yes. And also, it is a catalyst for radical change at many different levels and on many different scales. So, an excellent example would be the work of forensic architecture, um, which was founded by the Israeli-born architect A.L. Weizmann over a decade ago and has been operating out of London ever since. And forensic architecture has in invented an entirely new strand of both design and architecture by using design and architectural methodologies and tools and the new open source intelligence, the, um, which has proved so useful in identifying Russian war crimes in Ukraine of people um, taking still images and moving images on their phones, using CCTV cameras, using drone footage and so on to monitor dangerous, um, subversive, difficult and tragic situations. And forensic architecture has reinvented design as a tool of restorative social justice to investigate what has happened at scenes of criminality, whether they're war crimes, human rights crimes, climate crimes, to establish the truth and to secure justice and retribution for the, the victims. And so I think this is a fantastic example of revolutionary design, which is revolutionary in all aspects, in its intent, in its technologies, in its application, and in its impact. And there are more and more examples of that throughout design. And as divorce, design increasingly becomes this ever more elastic, eclectic, and fluid medium, it's able to adapt to changing situations and to find real life solutions like open source intelligence and these tools of restorative justice very quickly. So yes, design can be revolutionary and yes, it should be revolutionary. It has been throughout history and it should be now and in the future. Thank you. There are over here. Thank you. Good morning from El Decoration Vietnam. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, thank you for the meaningful talk. And uh, as you mentioned, there's always will be a design emergency. Uh, what do you think will be the next step uh, of this uh, project? Uh, I would like to see, you know, if I would like to see more story, more, you know, beautiful story like this in the future, uh, will I just uh, have to follow on Instagram? Would, what do you think this project, where will, will it evolve? Well, right now we're still on Instagram. It's design.emergency. And beyond the 25 interviews in the book, we've done more than double. You know, we're like beyond, we're almost at 70. And there are wonderful stories that we did not include in the book because the book, you know, it, it, there's always a work time. Uh, for instance, for the launch of the book on the 25th of May, as I mentioned, we re-interviewed Michael Murphy, but then we also had other conversations with designers and architects that go beyond the, uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and pandemic. So we think we will keep going. We will keep going. Um, we have interviews planned for next week and the week after, and we might take a break in the summertime, and then we'll reevaluate whether the platform is right, whether it should be a book, whether it should be a podcast, whether it should be a YouTube series. Really, uh, sky's the limit, and also our human capacities are the limit, because I have to say, it's a work of love, but it also takes a lot of work to produce things 
as beautifully, you know, and it's not only ours, it's also, of course, our publisher and our wonderful graphic designer, Frith Kerr, and uh, her collaborators at Studio Frith. So it's not effortless, but it really is worthwhile. So we think we'll keep going for quite a while, as long as there's going to be a design emergency, we'll be there. But really, we exhort you to look at the other IG Lives that are collected in the video channel in our Instagram feed. You'll find them all there, and they're riveting. Some of them more than others, but some, but they're always really deep. Like one of the people that we thought we might want to mention today is Francesca Coloni, who talks about refugee camps. I mean, there's so much that can be covered. So on the Instagram would be best. So please keep on going. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the lady with the green jacket also. Agnieszka, I'm just going to say that. Uh, hi, my name is Agnieszka. I'm from Poland and I've been your follower, as Paola knows, from the very beginning. And uh, actually my colleague uh, had the same question. I had the same question as my colleague, but maybe I could further it. Um, have you thought about talking to design schools to introduce a subject like design emergency? Because I think you came up with something very important and you answered some deep need to talk about design in a slightly different way. And um, well, both of us talk at, at design schools a lot and are involved in crits and, and so on. And there has been an enormous amount of interest in design emergencies. So we've both done lots of lectures. Um, I'm giving the keynote lecture for the Royal Society of Arts Student Design Prizes this year. And that's what the students wanted to um, hear about. So we're absolutely thrilled by the response to the project and what we hoped at the outset was that collectively we would show just how diverse the practice and possibilities of design are. So for say a teenager who's interested potentially in a design career, they will realize that there are so many different ways of practicing it practicing it and approaching it, and specifically by embedding it in the things they really, really care about, whether it's the climate emergency, the refugee crisis, or whatever. Um, but what um, has been fascinating is to see in recent years, before we launched Design Emergency, but since that time, how rapidly design schools internationally have changed. I mean, there's less and less interest in the traditional design disciplines as other disciplines and other forms of practice have expanded. And so I've been really impressed by how swiftly design schools have changed their curriculum to embrace these new ideas. And so, for example, on Monday, I'll be in Eindhoven at Design Academy Eindhoven in the Netherlands um, as the guest examiner for the final examination of the GeoDesign master's degree course, which was launched by Andrea Tremarki and Simone Fallison of former Phantasma two years ago. And the idea of that is that if designers are going to engage in these complex intersectional political, social, and environmental challenges, they need to have a more sophisticated understanding of the political context. And so geodesign is focusing on that. Um, I've obviously had sneak previews of all the students' theses, and it has been absolutely fascinating to read them and to see the dramatically different ways in which they've used design as a lens to interpret um, very complex, highly contentious political and cultural issues. And I think there'll be more and more of that from design schools to come. And if I may add to that, it's Alice is completely right, but I don't know if design emergency should be one discipline because it is transversal naturally. And it's best to give it as a lens and as a focus rather than give it as a teaching curriculum item, right? You know, I just was one of the um, guest critics at Princeton and the theme was power. And even in that case, it was about emergency. So we could keep on going. There are so many great topics and subjects that are addressed with this particular transversal approach of design emergency. Thank you. Any more questions? Huh? There was a lady. Was somebody um, raising their hands? It's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. She's in the middle. Too timid. You have to raise. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder whether you think that 
one of the ways to move forward with all of this is um, operating locally but sharing everything globally. And um, I don't know if you've read Flourish, the Michael Paulin book, but I'm interested in this concept of planetary consciousness and how we move from nation states, sorry, um, to address this because it's clearly a global issue and nation states are worried about GDP and that's the opposite of what we need to be thinking about. Is, how do we co address that? Because as you say, designers need to work on a bigger macro political level and how do we, I know you probably don't have the answers, but what do you think about that? Well, designer, um, one of the fascinating things about design is that is also one of its restrictions in that it does have the ability if you think of design elementally as an agent of change that can help us to ensure that changes of any type are interpreted positively rather than negatively, by definition, design can enter any sphere. But the negative is that it has to be empowered to do so. Now, that problem has lessened in recent years as affordable and accessible digital technologies have enabled designers increasingly to operate independently and to fundraise to fund their own epic ecological, political, and social projects. So they've been able to become self-starters should they wish to. But to operate on a, a massive scale, like the Great Green Wall of Africa, for example, that does need empowerment um, as well as engagement. And designers are only going to get that empowerment if they deserve it. And so designers like specialists from every other sector have to accept that if they want to be more ambitious, if they want to wrestle with these complex, huge challenges of our time, with greater power comes greater responsibility. And that every time one of these epic projects falters, it will make it much more difficult for other designers to secure the political support, the public approbation that they need to pursue them. Them, whereas every success will make it that little bit easier. And what we've tried to do with Design Emergency by having this huge variety of, of projects and different forms of design practice is by showing that designers operating at any scale, whether it's the design strategists and advocates working on the Great Green Wall of Africa project or Zutiantian as an individual architect working in a somewhat obscure rural region of China with her acupuncture interventions into those rural communities. So working really on a very intimate um, level, it's all valuable and it's all incredibly important. I mean, this is a phenomenal era of design experimentation where designers have opportunities and chances that they've never had before. I mean, that's glorious. It's a wonderful thing, but it's really up to designers and the quality of their output as to whether or not it will continue. If the design that's implemented is intelligent, anticipatory, thoughtful, sensitive, and responsible, and it's very easy for me to fling those adjectives around, it's incredibly difficult to deliver them. But if it achieves all those things, then we will enter a golden age of design experimentation. But um, it's fascinating that when we talk to people like Hilary Cotton, who began as a social scientist, who became a convert to design, so pioneered social design projects, but really addressing social science issues, provision of care for the elderly, how to help the long-term unemployed to return to employment, dealing with poor quality housing, and so on. She says that one of the reasons why she has been empowered to prototype new solutions to these problems is that there's a general acceptance in political and social science circles that the old methodologies were 20th century methodologies that are no longer fit for purpose. And so people in those fields are much more interested in experimenting and they really see design as a nimbler, more fluid, medium that can really help them. And Flourish, which was a wonderful book by Sarah Ishioka and Michael Paulin, is full of fantastic examples of projects that are precisely like that. Amen. And I would like to also um, add um, a project that you might find interesting by our colleague Jane Withers. It's the Bio 29 um, Biennial in Ljubljana, which is called Super Vernaculars. And in a way, it talks about this intimate dimension that Alice has, has uh, talked about as an alternative to instead the massive 
dimensions. So it's all scales. And in a way, yeah, trying to bypass the na na nation state seems to be the goal of all these designers and activists and uh, politicians that are working at all these different levels. If there are no more questions, there's okay, one, one last one, I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, during this time of so many challenges, what makes you hopeful? Each of you. <laughs> uh, I have to say design makes me hopeful. Um, tragic and terrible though the pandemic was for everyone. I have to say engaging with design emergency. I mean, partly because it meant, um, you know, Paola and I were great friends before the pandemic where thanks to design emergency, we're even better friends, which I wouldn't <laughs> have thought was possible. It's been so wonderful to collaborate with her and to challenge one another and, and so on. Um, but also dealing with the remarkable designers, architects, engineers, coders, illustrators, and others who we were talking to, so brave, so courageous, so imaginative, so resourceful and resilient, never accepting defeat, always coming up with constructive solutions. It's thanks to them that design emergency is interesting. All we're really doing is literally giving them a platform for their work. And so I'm a naturally optimistic person. I think that's why I'm drawn to design. I like to think there will always be a solution. And I'm so proud to engage with this extraordinary medium that's constantly changing. You can never become complacent if you're engaging with it, um, that is delivering real life solutions to really profound problems that are hugely difficult for so many people on many different scales. So that is an endless source of hope and optimism for me. Well, I mean, what can we say? I mean, it's perfectly said. I'm a pessimist instead, but design gives me hope. And I feel like a vampire whenever I feel that I'm depleted and that the sun is killing me. I just like go to some great designer and just like suck the life out of them. No, it's true. It's all true. Design gives us hope because even without thinking that it can change the world by itself, we know that it can help everybody together do something meaningful and design for our future and better selves, as Marva teaches us. So we would like to close our session here. We thank you so much for coming, but especially we thank Marva for giving us fresh blood every year <laughs> for our vampire needs. But really, thank you, Marva. Thank you, Alice. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.